This is Candid Campus. Profiles in Higher Education, presented jointly by the Higher Education Alumni Council of Oklahoma and the Oklahoma College Public Relations Association. The discussion today is a visit to Oklahoma State Tech in Oak Mulgee. Your host is Carter Bradley, Executive Director, Higher Education Alumni Council of Oklahoma. Welcome to Candid Campus, and welcome to the campus of Oklahoma State Tech at Oak Mulgee. This is another campus within the state system that provides innumerable opportunities for personal growth and career success to the people of Oklahoma. This institution is unique in that it provides vocational technical education beyond that which is available in the so-called area schools at the high school level. This is, in effect, a post-secondary type institution under Oklahoma State University as a branch of Oklahoma State University. And the director here is a vice president of OSU, Mr. Wayne Miller. I want to introduce you to uh, Wayne to the Candid Campus audience. Carter, thank you. and Welcome to one of the truly outstanding technical institutions in the nation. I know it is. How old is uh, Oklahoma State Tech? We're 31 years old, and so you've that's been, quite a new. You've been here since the beginning. I was an original staff member. I was away for a few years, and we can go on and come back against my will. And I see. Spend a little time off. But what is your enrollment here now? Some 3,200 plus students in the fall. We will enroll some 4,500 different students in our three trimester program. Why do you have a trimester program here, Wayne? Maximum utilization of facilities, of persons, of space, of equipment, all of those things that combine for us having a graduate directly ready to enter industry at a highly skilled technician level. And I understand your graduates are very much in demand in the business. Oh, industry. yes, we have many job offers for every graduate because really? we have this singular educational mission of depth. We put all of our money into one thing, preparing a person for a job in business or industry. Well, I'm eager to see the details of this operation here because I know the people of Oklahoma can be proud of the fact that we do have this kind of an operation. It is sort of unique in the whole world, is it not? Yes, and we hope that people will gather any young folks around their television set now that might be thinking about a career in vocational technical education. We want them to take a tour with us. Fine, let's go make it. Good, let's go. Let's go. Carter, to start this tour of Oklahoma State Tech, we're down in an area where craftsmanship is really at a premium. The auto body person has to be able to feel and see the, the straight metal and the good it is paint an art, job, yes. a real art. Then moving along into auto trim, that's auto upholstery, we call mm -hmm. trim in the trade, where they're going to do the entire interior of the car, the headliners, the panels, the seats. Another art, selecting the colors, cutting the expensive material. Then on our left, we go in, it says watch repair, it's watch repair, jewelry manufacturing. What a crowd in there. Oh, Wayne. good crowd and good jobs waiting when they get out. They do jewelry manufacturing. They can do micro-instrumentation work. Micro-instrumentation work. Right. The people do the minute lathe work. I see. The big lathe, the little lathe. I see. Furniture upholstery, closely akin in the pattern making and all of the auto upholstery, but they work on just furniture. Certainly beautiful furniture there. They take every piece down to the bare frame, repair the frame, retie the springs, and go back up and restore it to look better than new for the most that part. That certainly is an art also, yeah. isn't it? Uh, certain art. Then dry cleaning. Everybody wants just one crease in each trouser leg. Yes. There's a chemistry of spot removing without removing the material. So in dry cleaning, you have the cleaning procedure, the spotting. Looks like the they're doing a good business in there, too. finishing and silk finishing. Now let's take a look in the leather department. Okay. Go in where they make they repair shoes, they make boots. They Golly, make look at the boots and the saddles. Handicraft work deluxe. Yes, Carter, the students in here make beautiful boots and saddles. See some here in different stages of construction. Yes. And moving right on over here, we have JoLynn Baker from Kansas working on what I'm told is a fully tool, a full tool saddle. A full some, tool saddle. Yes. Now that means a lot of handwork and a lot of craftsmanship and a lot of artisan work went into it. And we're talking about about 50 different pieces of leather that had to all come together, had to be planned, patterned, cut properly, and she's dealing with very expensive material in today's leather prices. Joanne, it's a beautiful piece of work. 
And here we have more boots. More people in the process of boot making. Let's meet the head of the department, Mr. Earl Bain, Carter Bradley. Hello, Earl. There, sir. This is a fascinating place. I don't believe there's anything like it elsewhere in Oklahoma, is there, Earl? Uh, no, sir, this is the only school like it in the state. And uh, what do you teach here? We teach shoe repair, boot making, and saddle making. In the shoe repair and boot making and saddle making, do all the students learn all three uh, skills or usually specialize in one of those? No, sir, we have students that learn all three skills, and then some that come just for saddle making and some for just boot making. I'm amazed at the amount of activity here. Uh, are, um, are uh, all these people uh, going to be employed when in, the, in boot making or in saddle making? A uh, few will be employed. Most of the students through this department goes into business for themselves. We've been averaging about 75 to 80 percent of the individuals going directly into business. I call that employment. They do very they, well. They certainly do. They're self-employed. And uh, do they, uh, uh, is there this kind of demand for saddlery now and, uh, in this part of the world? Yes, sir. It's the biggest demand in our field today in the history of this country. Our society demands more, more quality, and more custom design work than they ever have before. You mean we, we use more boots and saddles now than we did back when the horse was practically the only means of transportation? When the horse was a means of transportation and the beast of burden, they was relied on as a work animal today. It's a pleasure animal, and our population will exceed it by three to four times. Let's see a sample of the finished boot, Earl, before we go. It's getting close to time. This is some boots that's being constructed on order for an individual. It must be it's an OSU uh, fan. I'm sure Gotta it is. Got to be. <laughs> Earl, thank you very much. We need to go over for some diesel power now, and thank you a lot. Thank, thank you, you, Earl. Thank you. You know, there's a certain amount of poetry, Wayne, in moving from uh, boots and saddles and an ancient form of transportation into this uh, building here with all these big engines. Now, this is what? This is a diesel and heavy equipment department, and I'm glad we need both forms of transportation. I want you to meet Boyd Self, the head of our diesel and heavy equipment department. Boyd, Carter. Boyd just has 450 full-time day students and 15 instructors helping him operate this facility of some 70,000 square feet of floor space, over $2 million worth of equipment, six separate shops. This is only one of six. Each trimester, a full two-year program, they're in a separate, well-equipped shop with separate instructors. And about how many students each trimester? About 450 on a normal of, of average. Now, they work on these uh, large engines, which look like these are oil field or uh, marine engines. Uh, right? Oil field, uh, oil field service type engines, truck type engines, and dirt moving type engines that I see. are used in the field. And do you do, uh, the, uh, do, you, do you do the actual breaking down of these big engines? Uh, Completely disassemble, uh, reassemble, learning all the overhaul procedures that they might find out in the field. Then you put them on a dime monitor, be sure they did it right. Put them on the dynamometer, or do all the tests and the troubleshooting procedures, and, and the engine ought to be ready to go. And you say there's $2 million worth of equipment in this one one area? No, in the total department, in, more in, than $2 in, million. In the diesel and uh, yeah, well, the engine department. Of course, I we've see. been 30 years putting together some of the equipment. Boyd, I've just got, Boyd, I've just got to ask you a question. Uh, what is the life expectancy of an automobile diesel engine in terms of mileage as compared to a gasoline uh, automobile? Uh, in my opinion, Carter, uh, probably a diesel engine normal about 500,000 miles, where a gasoline, gasoline engine probably 100,000. We've That's got to go, maintenance. Carter, to the next department, look at what's back of the engine, the powertrain transmission difference. Okay, let's go. Carter, in, the, in this class, we teach everything from the engine back, starting with the clutch, the transmission, the rear end assembly, the drive lines, uh, uh, power, power trains all the way through that are used in heavy equipment. Uh, automatic transmissions like this one. What does an automatic transmission, that's a truck transmission, what does a unit like that cost? Carter, this, this unit right here costs about $5,500. So when it's repaired, it's got to be done right. Yes, sir. It's, you could uh, buy a car for that. Sure could. Wayne, how many uh, hours a week will a student spend in a laboratory of this kind? 20 hours a week, four hours a day, five days a week, and a combination of theory and laboratory experiences. Uh, theory being the, uh, the, um, the arithmetic and well, involved the, in... The technical knowledge of things, pneumatic hydraulics, you're into applied physics, you're into applied mechanical... Things. Pneumatic hydraulics. Yeah, this is, it's real complicated. Is that involved in a... Sure, in the powertrain and the transmission. I see. The, it's, it's rather uh, in-depth application 
threw out of the mechanical and uh, pneumatic and hydraulic aspects of any moving vehicle. And they actually have to then uh, be able to uh, uh, know the uh, how the hydraulics work within a transmission. As a matter of fact, one of measure. our bi biggest fields now is hydraulics. We're expanding into another seven and a half week segment because so much of our heavy equipment has to do with hydraulic units. Moving the equipment, see nothing but a big line of power hoses on all heavy equipment. In other words, to move things like power shovels and, yeah. and the front end loaders, I see. dirt moving equipment. And that's about all the time we can afford to spend in this very, very important phase. We need to move on up now to the lecture. Well, that sure looks complicated. It is. Well, let's go on. Carter, we're now in the electrical uh, class where we teach uh, alternators and starters. The students there are using test equipment for tune-up procedures and, and things on that engine and we teach uh, all the electrical things that you might find around a piece of heavy equipment. What you're telling me is that uh, to be a good expert engine mechanic now, you've got to be an expert electrician. Yes, sir, and you need to know how to troubleshoot and all these things. I the see. engine won't start, nothing else matters. This is a starting system. Did I hear you write that, a, that uh, the fuel pump serves as a carburetor on a diesel engine? Yes, and that's still in another laboratory where we have 15 more weeks of four hours a day in the fuel pump and the fuel injection system, the nozzle. Fuel injection system, right, the nozzle, is a 15-week course. Right, four hours a day, five days a week. Is that for all kinds of engines? Um, all diesel engines must have this. I see. Cars, heavy to equipment, To complete this two-year course in diesel mechanics, and you'd have to have that. Right. I see. Now, we came through some uh, hydraulic testing equipment earlier that you said you were real proud of. Tell me about that. Yes, our, our hydraulic testing equipment, uh, we just got on board recently. We're fixing to expand that particular part, and those test stands we're real proud of that you saw a few minutes now, ago. Now, the students uh, actually learn how to measure the pressures that uh, go into the system. and Pressures, uh, uh, and also the flow of the, of the fluid through the pump and the control valves and this kind of thing. I also noticed a big diesel truck in there uh, where did you get that? This was a donated unit, uh, and we have anti-skid brakes fixed up on that truck. Is that right? And Carter, you know, behind all the heavy equipment, mechanics must be a good machine shop. And we need to go down there and see what the machinists learn. Let's now. go. Let's go. Boyd, you're all going to see riding a wave of the future over there in diesel. I thank you for that tour. I wish I'd had more time. Thank you very much, Carter. Come back and see us. Thank you, sir. Let's take a look in on that machinist program now, numerical control machinist. This the is after control right. machinists. With a computer. This is after the students have had four trimesters of industrial machinists. And meet Mr. Walter Smith, who heads up this program. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mr. Bradley. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What happens here? Well, in the numerical control, we have two ways of programming. One by hand, where the where the programmer will list everything out on a program sheet such as this, sir. Mm -hmm. This sir is a language that tells the machine what to do, where to go and what to do after what it gets there. What is this there. machine, a lathe? No, sir, this could be a lathe, it could be a milling machine, it could be a grinder, anything. Uh, Make any kind of shaped object. Yes, sir. What yes, part does this? Okay, the more sophisticated the particular part is, means that we have to leave the hand program and go to computer-aided programming. Uh, this machine here will handle all the math routines for very sophisticated part programming. And translates it onto a tape, which then is fed into the uh, yes of the machine. Mm -hmm. I see. Tape very similar to this, which we'll see operate over in the machine room. Well, about sure. time to go over there too. Okay. I think we better go take a look at the machine room. All right. Lead on. <laughs> Walter, this is very sophisticated equipment. What is your educational background? How did you get into computer-controlled lathes and milling machines? Well, after two years, Mr. Bradley, at the uh, University of Tulsa, I transferred to the General Motors Institute in Flint, Michigan. We spent two months in the classroom and two months in a plant situation. And uh, how long were you in this uh, General Motors Institute? Two years. And you finished then a, with an equivalent of a bachelor's degree? Yes, sir. Well, tell us how this works now. We're here with these okay. big machines. We produced this tape on the piece of computer equipment. This is a paper perforated tape? Yes. The mm -hmm. tape is put into the machine control unit and causes the table to move, we hope, in the right directions. We'll show you. 
okay? Now the pencil, the green pencil, really replaces uh, what would be a cutting tool normally. Yes. I see. The, uh, this allows us to do what we call debug a program to make sure that uh, we don't uh, have a situation where the cutting tool will be going into a piece of the work where we don't want it. Mm -hmm. It could be into the vise or some other holding fixture that we, that we uh, have holding the piece of work down. This uh, machine then is in effect a machine tool. Yes, sir. Making metal parts that might go in other machines. Into other machines or into the everyday products that you and I use. How many years of industrial experience, Walt, well, you have to go with your degree? Uh, a little over 21 years. 21 years. Well, you all know what it's all about, then. I hope so, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, Jess, it's nice back here. You'd like to see this a whole lot longer, but just a little warm in here. Why don't we go over to air conditioning and refrigeration, Carter? Okay. Walt, well, thank you very much. Yes, Carter, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Carter, we're now in our air conditioning and refrigeration department, another one of our very high-level technician programs a sixth trimester program. We're in the fourth trimester laboratory. I want you to meet Alvin Arterberry, the head of our department. Hey, Hello, Mr. Alvin. You know, I have seen here a great deal of, uh, of equipment and uh, what appears to be grocery cases out of a grocery store or a large uh, packing plant, plus a lot of uh, machinery and control panels, dozens of them. Uh, just what kind of education goes on here? This is the commercial medium and low temp uh, four trimester class and the equipment that you see here is what the serviceman will see in the back of the store. Okay. The customer will see these cases. Art, this, as, as we've yes, been sir. in other departments, we've noted the need for the electrician along with being a good mechanic. As I look at those control boxes and wires, it looks like to me this is a prime requirement of your technicians. Right. We do have our own electrical course here because 80% of the problems that we have in our industry are associated with the electrical problems. And troubleshooting technicians? Uh, troubleshooting, yes. And most of the people who take this course then will be troubleshooter type uh, repair uh, personnel? Right. They troubleshoot and after they find the problem then they must be able to make the necessary repairs. Is there a great demand for this kind of education? Uh, yes. Let me give you an example. Last trimester we had 20 graduates and we had uh, 50 interviewers in and they needed a total of about 65 students, so there's a great demand for this type of technician. You could have used three times as many graduates, or replaced three times as many graduates yes. as you had. Mike mentioned that yesterday we had three interviewers at one time here. Let's go look department. now at the last trimester of that in air conditioning, another very sophisticated lab that gets them ready for industry. Right. Now you call this the sixth trimester air conditioning laboratory. Right. Alvin, what is this particular unit here with all the flashing lights? This is a heat pump demonstrator. This is used in our classroom to show how a heat pump system works. Uh, we hear a lot about heat pumps these days, so this is a new training aid, and it is a reverse cycle air conditioning heating system. And uh, heat pumps are going to come in more and more use, I take it. Right. Uh, sales have tripled for most companies in the last two or three years. And that means we've got to have a lot more people trained to be able to maintain them. Right. A uh, heat pump is one of the most sophisticated pieces of unit that we have in our industry. Is it true that a heat pump is more efficient than a uh, straight electrical type uh, stove? Right. This is one of the selling points. Uh, a heat pump can be anywhere from 40 to 60 percent more efficient than straight resistance heat. Uh, one of the reasons is you That's get electric, the heat straight of, electric heat. Straight electric heat. One mm -hmm. of the reasons you get the uh, heat of compression out of this and you get more output than input into this system. I see you have a lot of other uh, panels and boards here and I'd like to take a look at one or two more. Okay. Now this is a two-stage air conditioning troubleshooting system. We have the controls brought out on front and actually have the units in the back, the evaporator, condenser, cooling coil, and what have you. We have 39 problems, electrical problems, that we can put into this system. And this is more or less a, a schematic, then, of various kinds of circuits. Right. This, uh, this is the schematic brought out to front, and these are checkpoints. Students can take their voltmeters, amp meters, what have you, and make checks here. What would this be like into an industry, uh, an apartment house air conditioning unit, or something Well, it can simpler? be an apartment. Well, generally, it's a commercial type air conditioning and heating, the larger systems. Even though this doesn't look uh, very large, it represents the larger units that you will find in industry. 
I assume that with the great emphasis of being put on energy conservation that this kind of education has become more and more in demand. Right. As I said earlier, we do have a great demand for our graduates. You know, this kind of equipment, these kind of people is what makes our program great. But another thing that makes it really great is the backing we get from our friends in business and industry. You know, we have three representative individuals here representing our advisory committees. We want to talk with them because they really give us the background to make us solid. Thank you, Alvin. Yes, sir. Let's go look at them then. Carter, several dozen men and women represent Oklahoma State Tech on a very important advisory committees. We're most fortunate to have three of them with us today. My pleasure to present on my immediate left, Mr. Jimmy Swank, President of Technical Systems Incorporated from prior Oklahoma, but of greater importance, he's a 1959 Oklahoma State Tech graduate. He serves on our Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Committee. Next to him, from Halliburton Services, Manager of Transportation Department, Mr. Dwayne Christian, a longtime visitor to this campus. And next to them is John Connor, vice, executive vice president of the Oklahoma Automobile Dealers Association, heads up a team of some 500 members statewide, or is it more than that, John? All on the Oklahoma State Tech team. John, you're an old friend. Tell me, why is it the Oklahoma Automobile Dealers Association would have some such special interest in this particular institution? Well, Carter, the backbone of many of the franchise dealerships in Oklahoma is the service department. And we need young men and women to come in and take a position and place it in the service department as well as the parts department and the uh, body shops. We get many of our new people from Oklahoma State Tech. Our dealers last year probably employed about 90% of the graduates from Oklahoma State Tech from the in, in the automotive school here. 90% would be 90% would be how many people, Some Wayne? Some 300 people from three trimester graduation of automotive only. Is that right? Well, uh, Jimmy Swank, tell me first, uh, I want to ask you the same question, but tell me first, what is Technical Systems Incorporated? Technical Systems is in the business of designing, applying, and manufacturing commercial and industrial refrigeration equipment. And you are a graduate of uh, Oklahoma State Tech yourself? Yes, I graduated in 59. And uh, how many people do you have on your payroll over there prior? We have uh, approximately 80. And do you hire, do you hire people from this institution uh, regularly? Yes, we hire people primarily in the area of uh, field service, field application, and engineering. None uh, of our plant people, per se, have graduated from here. No, we're not training assembly line type people. Right. right. That, uh, you're training, we're training technicians here, and you're hiring the, them into technical jobs. Yes. Tell me, uh, Jimmy, you're familiar with the, uh, with the type of vocational technical education systems we have in Oklahoma. A person who has been to a high school and taken some VOTEC education would you uh, uh, prefer to have them go on to an institution of this kind or come directly to uh, technical systems for employment? Generally speaking, uh, uh, secondary education, both tech graduates, are of not great value to us. We feel that uh, the role that uh, secondary both tech plays is at least acquaint people well enough with certain fields to determine if they should continue education. But I think it's certainly required that they continue in a place like Oklahoma State Tech. Well, that's very interesting. Dwayne, I want to ask you uh, about Halliburton. Halliburton is one of the large worldwide corporations that sort of started in Oklahoma. How many people do you hire out of Oklahoma State Tech uh, over a period of years? We were on a survey here. Uh, <clears throat> year or two ago, and we have probably about 350 graduates on our payroll today. That would be uh, people that's graduated since, say, 1955. What skills particularly would they be in, Wayne? Uh, primarily they're in uh, out of the diesel and uh, heavy equipment schools. We have a number out of the automotive. We have a number uh, out of drafting, electronics. We even have uh, one of the graduates working for us out of the bakers and, and the cook school over there. Right. So one, of the, one of the things that we missed today in this tour of Oklahoma State Tech is the uh, bakery uh, school, and I regret that uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons. But, uh, Wayne, how, how large is that bakery uh, and hotel operation? Well, here? ours is, we have two departments of culinary arts, the cooks and chefs, and then the baking, two separate programs. And we'll run 90 to 120 students in each department. 
Now, each of these gentlemen represent a different advisory committee. Right. And Diesel, automotive, and air conditioning refrigeration. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how many such advisory committees do you have? We have one for every major department on campus, so that's some 14 different major areas. And they meet two and three times a year. And they not only just come and give us advice on kind of equipment we should purchase, they conduct seminars for us, they help us in getting donations, uh, Halliburton Services, OADA, a uh, large organization that put money, not just their mouth, but they put money in the form of scholarships. John, you might want to allude to that, in the form of money to assist in instructor upgrading is coming to us from Halliburton Foundation. Okay, John, there's your there's your cue. Tell us about the uh, Carter, Automobile Leaders uh, Scholarship Program. Carter, we're very proud. Some eight years ago, we began a scholarship and loan program to help the auto, um, those students in automotive that need this kind of assistance. Since then, the automobile dealers in Oklahoma have probably given some $50,000 in cash plus many uh, pieces of equipment, uh, cast off parts for training aids and, and uh, give the students an opportunity to really have a hands-on experience in their training over here. Carter, if it wasn't for this kind of donation, our state support is good, but it's not good enough to support all the equipment you've seen today on campus. And this institution is largely supported with state funds and not federal funds, isn't it? Right. State funds and student fees are 99, 9 of our income. And uh, the student fees here, how do they run compared to, say, uh, to the junior colleges across the state, uh, Wayne? Well, we operate differently. We operate on the clock hour, and the fees are all inclusive, but it's a little bit more expensive, and of course I've been told by those who give us the money, that's because you have a more expensive type of education, and we do. A lot more expensive equipment, so it's a little higher. Well, I know that the success of this institution depends largely upon people like Dwayne and Jimmy and John, who represent large industrial groups and uh, or interests to make an operation uh, and a unique institution like Oklahoma State Tech go. We're about out of time here, and uh, Wayne, I want to thank you for the hospitality you've shown Candy Campus for letting us come see this operation today. And I also want to thank uh, the Oklahoma Education Television Authority for the use of its mobile videotaping unit again. We are happy to have you with us on Candy Campus today. Goodbye until next time. Candid Campus is presented under joint sponsorship by the Higher Education Alumni Council of Oklahoma and the Oklahoma College Public Relations Association. This is the Oklahoma State University Educational Television Services.